Welcome to the Wooden Hobbyist YouTube channel. I'm Sean. In this video, we're going to show you how to use these templates we make and sell to turn this hard maple into this bass guitar. <coughs> You'll see an outline of a neck and headstock here, but in this video we're focusing on the body design and construction. There's a link in the description for that neck video. You guys likely know my friend Andrew. He's the dumb looking fellow that looks like he eats plain Cheerios with water. We're starting with him using his Irwin pole saw to make a definite line to follow with a handheld jigsaw to work the neck blank to a more manageable length to mill and maneuver. From there we had to give it a good cut with the Laguna Resaw King before moving it over to the jointer. We had a 3 quarter by 115 inch blade installed for the cuts you'll see in this video. We went to one of our local wood warehouses to pick out some wood. I like a bit of a gritty bass tone so I wanted the main construction of this instrument to be hard maple. Admittedly not a very exciting wood, domestic to eastern North America but the producer of sap that gets turned into that sweet and delicious amber nectar of the gods, maple syrup. It's a nice, dense, durable wood and this particular 10 foot 8 quarter blank of which there was only one left had some beautiful figure. Andrew got this piece of lumber all squared up to make it easier to reference as we rip, plane, and resaw to get closer to the finished product. We used an Oliver Shelix planer with a helical cutter to further mill the beautiful lump of dead tree to our desired thickness. A little trick you can use is to thoroughly mark the side you are planing with a pencil so you can easily see the progress you are making toward flatness. Get yourself a good set of clamps. These Jorgensen parallel clamps are fantastic for large flat glue ups. And they're bright orange, so you'll never lose them. You'll see Andrew applying a sufficient amount of glue to the binding surfaces and you don't need to spread it all the way to the edges. Let the wood, the clamps, and physics do some of your work. You need a break. After letting the glue set for 30 or more minutes, the longer the better, it's safe to remove the clamps. Read the instructions on the bottle of your favorite glue to get a better idea of an ideal set time. We use Titebond 3 a lot, and that's what we're using here. And unless you have some secret method you use for glue ups, you'll likely have a little seepage from the mating surfaces. We used a cabinet scraper. It can remove insanely fine layers to make those joints, edges, and curves absolutely perfect. If you use a destructive method of glue removal like most of us do, you're going to want to make sure your surfaces are level. Jet makes a great drum sander with an almost infinite level of adjustment so you can really dial in your surfacing depth. While we were waiting for some help at the wood warehouse, we noticed some pre-cut and packaged wood veneers. We got stoked when we started fingering through them like the whole town does your mom. They had Ziracote, Bubingo, Walnut, Zebra, and several others. But our favorite was the Redwood Burl. Oh my goodness, does this veneer slap. It's sick. I love it, so we slapped it on the guitar. The blue painter's tape was used to hold the glued redwood veneer in place on the hard maple body while it spent some time in the chamber of death. I mean the vacuum press. We layered parchment paper, then a piece of MDF over the veneer to protect it during this seemingly nonviolent process. The plywood was used to keep the outlet of the vacuum press from being sucked up against the MDF, allowing the pump to provide adequate pressure to the entire mating surface for a reliable finished product. I mean, would you just look at it? It's beautiful. When we bought these veneers we noticed some imperfections in them like these holes that are being filled with CA glue. This burl is just so beautiful and we didn't want to miss out on the opportunity to use them. So like most folks out there, we figured this would be an acceptable route to take to utilize these exceptional veneers. I got Andrew to pick his knuckles up off the ground and help me get this design refined. I knew only one thing going into this build. I wanted something that resembled a Rickenbacker from tail to headstock. We had the wood and we had the design cut out on some acrylic stock and busted out this sexy logo on it. We came back to the Resaw King to get the rough shape cut out using dozens of relief cuts to make it easier to get around the curvy nature of this guitar. Without relief cutting, you can do some serious damage to a blade of this width and potentially yourself. So make those relief cuts. All in all, it came out exactly the way I like it though. Nice and rough. We even got a few cool looking pieces of scrap we might use for something else. Compared to those bandsaw cuts, the next step was as breezy as the space between my ears. We used a Makita RT0701C with a half inch by half inch Astra coated flush trim bit to clean up the top portion of the rough cut body. We started high and stepped it down so we could finish it up on the router table with an Infinity Mini Mega 06-128 flush trim router bit. It was still a little rough, but we're not even at half shaft on this one yet. We're just getting started. 
Another Astra coated bit was used for hogging out the pickup pocket so the flush trim bit wouldn't overheat and end up dull. This one is a quarter inch diameter. Andrew's very familiar with this measurement. When you have this much wood dust flying around, you're going to want to protect your god given airbags with a decent respirator. You don't want this stuff in your lungs, they're just not meant for that. This is that mini megabit in action. Look at it go! I kept the distinct body cutaway shapes of the Rickenbacker 4003 but accentuated them a little bit to accommodate a couple more frets on the fingerboard. Ricks typically have 20 frets, I wanted 22, and we ended up with 24. We implemented a perfect centerline etching on these templates to line up everything perfectly, from tail to headstock. We used an appropriately sized drill bit to effectively do the job of a center punch because we didn't have one of those. You finally see me here, prying the template off the redwood veneer. It didn't go exactly as planned. Look at this abomination. This is basically what this bandsaw was meant to do. This was an 8 quarter plank of wood, and you really don't need an electric guitar to be that thick. One of my favorite features of the Resaw King is that it transforms into a drum sander. Just kidding, but look at that freaking maple. This is where the bridge mounting holes are being drilled with the very bit we used as a center punch. It's amazing how versatile the tools can be with a little imagination. You might have noticed that there is a bit of exposed maple just behind the bridge after applying the redwood veneer. That was totally and 100% intentional. That didn't have anything to do with us realizing the length of the veneer was less than that of the longer cutaway of the body of the base after we had already purchased it. Nothing at all. What we decided to do is exhibit the beautiful maple underneath the veneer with this little slant thing we're going to call the perversion. You know, because I don't know what it's called, and I doubt all opinions will be aligned with the virtue of this design decision. Hey! More inappropriately used drill bits. We're lining up the neck pocket for routing and they worked great in this situation. I honestly struggled a little bit with this. I haven't done a lot of routing and the design of this thing didn't help me here at all. This hand plane did though. This could be one of the most satisfying woodworking tools that exists. We like our wrists to be fully functioning though, so when it came to contouring the body, we knew we had to use alternate methods. Andrew used a dovetail saw and an arrangement of chisels to rough out a beautiful cutaway. This is what woodworking is about, right? It obviously needed some refinement after the chisels, so a selection of hand rasps was used to bring it further into spec. These things are sweet if you need to contour or anything. Notice the pencil lines slowly disappearing. Pencils are great for getting an idea of where you want your wood to be. Did I mention that the veneer was brittle? It was practically a nightmare to work with, but I wouldn't have it any other way. There needed to be a clean line between the burl and the maple. We tried using a razor to cut a hard line in the veneer so we could chisel the bits we met. I mean, uh, I mean, didn't want. That kind of worked, but not in a way that preserves the veneer like we wanted. We'll come back to that later. I used a spindle sander to clean up the routing lines on the edges of the body. For the cleanest lines, start behind where you stopped for a nice uniform finish. You may end up with a little chatter, but it's easier to clean that up than it is to hand sand the entire perimeter of this thing. Remember that abomination we aggressively pointed out earlier? Well, we had a plan. And a Freud 2 inch wave cutter Forstner bit on a drill press was part of it. After the dissatisfaction of the cut and chisel method, we decided that routing a line following the curve of the body against the veneer was the best way to keep the transition clean. And it makes for a unique look. There was some detail work to be done, but we finally got that hard line between the maple and the redwood. There was a weird transition here because of the angle of the cut from the router, so a little chiseling was in order. This is generally subjective work, just try to make it look good in your eyes. So satisfying though. Just look at those curly little shavings. You may see this and think, it's too early for finish. And generally, I would agree with you. But we needed to protect the wood while it sat as we went to our day jobs and it helped save the veneer from the inevitable scratching as we worked on the backside of the body. We sanded the body with 500 grit sandpaper and applied Osmos Gloss Pollux Oil. We were hoping for a deep gloss to really accentuate the grain without using a polyurethane. You want to make sure you get a good even coat across every surface of your work. It'll be better for the wood, the finish, and your sanity. To cover the electronics, a bit of flamed maple Andrew had from our guitar build link in the description, was used to make a unique backing plate. He made an inlay template on the CNC that followed the contours of the lower part of the body and proceeded to make the inlay and route out the pocket for all the electronics. 
I'm not saying this for any particular reason, but make sure you have all your pickup hardware on hand before you resaw your body. Just saying. After getting the inlay cut and finagled to size, and the pocket hogged out, it was time to put some finish on the inlay. We flooded it with Danish oil, let it soak for a second, and wiped off the excess. I think it makes for a great contrast against the hard maple. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Coming back to our little mess up from removing the acrylic template, we decided to effectively cover up our mistake with a zero coat day tone knob. We got the CNC fired up once more to cut a perfect circle out of some leftovers and used cove bit to make an indentation on the knob for adjustments. All that was left after all these trials and tribulations was to install the bridge, pickups, and knobs and attach the neck. Check the description for all the tools and templates we used and be sure to check out that neck video. If there's anything you think we missed, be sure to drop it in the comments below. <laughs> Go check out that neck video.